record. And I'm going to share my screen. So hopefully that's going there. And um, let me just go ahead and plug this guy in. What is it going? Site here. Okay. Get my little clicker. All right. So let's get going. There's a lot of stuff to discuss. Uh, this class um, is it, it, it's a complicated class to run, uh, and it's a complicated class to do for you guys. But it's actually a, a it, it's a really fun class to teach, and it's also from what I've heard, a fun class to take. So, so hopefully it'll be good experience for all of us involved. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, get my little clicker here. Okay. All right. So let's jump, jump right into it. Um, all right. So intro to game development. Um, yeah, so it's an introduction to video game development. I'm not assuming any prior knowledge or any skills, but more than just video game development, you're going to learn a whole host of other things. And that's, as you'll see in the upcoming slides, this is the reason that I'm teaching this class. It's not really about video game development per se, but it's a whole host of other things that we can get to through the topic of video game development. So you'll learn, you know, obviously the video game design stuff, but we're also going to do a lot of software engineering kinds of things, right? Talking about how to construct these systems. Um, product design and pro project management is really important part of this class and it's something that's really important in, in real life as well. And, and a lot more, some aesthetic stuff, some art stuff, like there's a lot involved uh, in, in this class. And we'll be using the Unity 3D framework to develop our games and to do all this. Uh, and and like I said at the very beginning, I'll, I'll, I'll warn you guys, you know, this class is uh, <laughs> a lot of work uh, but it's also a lot of fun as well. So let's give you some background as to, you know, why I'm teaching this class, why I'm excited about this class. Uh, so first of all, I'm a professor in electric computer engineering with a joint appointment in computer science. My name is Pradeep Sen, by the way. Um, and uh, my research in computer graphics. Can I can I just dim the lights here because some of these graphics will not come out so well. Let me um, do that. Is that better? So uh, we do a lot of work with companies like Disney, on the, on the rendering systems to uh, improve the quality and so on. So this is a shot from the movie Coco. One of my students worked on um, uh, with Pixar to develop the the noise that they use for their films to produce their their final results. Uh, and so this is an example of some of the work that we do. Uh, but you know you're not here to hear about computer graphics. You're here to hear you're here to uh, you're here to hear about uh, video game stuff. So. I, I've been making video games since I was eight years old. Uh, this is kind of how I got into graphics. Uh, I really wanted to make games like those that I loved, and this is going to date me a little bit, but basically I was growing up in the Apple IIe era, and so the games were like Load Runner and uh, Hard Hat Mac and Choplifter and so on. Or we had, uh, or there, folks had, uh, you know, an Atari 2600, and so you had games like the Pac-Man or uh, Pitfall or Asteroids and things like that, right? And these are the kind of games that I wanted to emulate. Um, and so I was really, um, sorry, I was inspired by the magazines that they had at the time because we didn't have any internet. So I was looking in the back of magazines to find how to do um, programs. And that's kind of how I learned how to program and things like that. And, uh, you know, my first games that I made really sucked. Uh, but then gradually over time, I got better at it. And, and this is kind of a lesson that we'll keep revisiting in this class. And that is that you learn by iteration. So everyone has bad game, what I call bad games in them. And so you make them and get them out of your system and you get better over time as you make them. And at some point after you make enough of them, uh, your games will start getting better and 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 better. And, and this is something that applies to many things like people say writing books or making films or research as well, right? It's, it's just about repetition and, and getting familiar with something and doing it over and over again, right? And um, in this class, we're going to be uh, embracing this policy. So we'll we'll be implementing as many games as we can in just these 10 weeks that we have together. Uh, and at the same time, our final project will also be the product of a lot of iteration, right? So this class is going to be fundamentally different than any other class you've taken. In the typical class, when you have a final project, the teacher assigns it, you work on it, work on it, work on it, work on it, and then you turn it in. That, that's the way it usually works, right? 
this is not how it's going to work here because we cannot do high quality stuff that way. Nothing, it, it doesn't work like that in industry, right? They don't say go build an iPhone and you go work on it and then you give them the iPhone right before the launch. It, it just doesn't work. The way it works is you iterate and iterate and iterate and iterate, right? You come up with version one, version two, version three, uh, you know, proof of concepts and things, you know, so we'll go through that and, and you keep iterating and gradually increasing the quality of your product till the final product is actually pretty good, right? And so we're going to embrace a more industry-centered way of thinking. And that's why kind of one of the reasons that I want to teach a class like this. Um, any questions about it so far? Right? Makes sense? So my background, so I did my uh, bachelor's at Purdue University, which is now in the, in the final four for the first time in a long time. Uh, and then I did my PhD at Stanford, where I was working in graphics. So my work, my early days in programming games when I was little really motivated me to sort of be in this kind of field. And I got really excited when I at Stanford, um, they had the opportunity to do graphics stuff there. So for example, we were working on um, real time game graphics, uh, you know, like in the typical uh, games. Even today, you see lots of little jagged artifacts here from Shadow Maps. We'll, we'll talk about graphics later on in the class. Uh, uh, but basically you get these little jaggedy looking things like that when you have shadows cast by characters. And so when I was there, we developed kind of a better technique to give uh, little crisper shadows, for example, that was used in games. Another big contribution was at the time, uh, we had games like Quake, right? Uh, or Doom 3, for example, in this case, uh, where when you uh, walk up to some, uh, you know, in this case, the vending machine in this Martian environment, uh, you see this kind of like little jagged kind of stuff because they're basically like low res bitmaps that are being upsampled. And so we developed a technique where they could have crisp textures for like detail and things like that. And they started using them in the games and stuff like that. So contributing. And we were also, you know, I was also working on games even, even then, and we would compete in various competitions. And that's a younger version of me. Uh, for example, in this case, it was a competition where we were given like three hours on a random machine to make a, a game. And you had to learn how to even use the machine in the first place. So it was kind of cool. Um, and then when, uh, after I graduated with my PhD, I went to the University of New Mexico and I started a video game program very, very similar to what we're talking about here. So from 2006, 2012, I was doing that. And right before I left, the program was ranked uh, in the top 10, which was really exciting. And I want to do the same thing here. So basically that's my objective. And so since 2020, I've started what we call the UCSB Gaucho Game Lab. Right, and I'm going to talk about that uh, next. So basically, the idea of our lab, as you say, Gaucho Game Lab, is to develop a community at UCSB that's interested in game development, to train the next generation of game developers, but also software engineers. Right, this is not just about game development. We're using game development as a means to an end, and uh, obviously help our graduates be recruited and hired by the top tech companies, uh, build a nationally ranked program, which would be great, just like we did at UNM. Uh, being, bring uh, visibility to UCSB, right? What, one thing that's really exciting is that games have a way to reach a much broader audience than anything else we do at the university, right? Like people care about games, but they don't care about information theory or compilers or operating systems or, or anything else. But games like athletics interest the broader public. So that's, that's exciting. Yeah. And so we wanna improve UCSB's brand name in, 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 in through gaming. Uh, and also then, improve diversity because it reaches such a broad audience, right? We can bring a lot more people into the uh, College of Engineering tent because of the broad appeal of games. So why should we even care about games? Because a lot of people say, well, I'm not really that much into games. Why should I take this class or why am I interested in this? Well, first of all, games are really fun to work on. They offer a lot of uh, interesting uh, problems from a software engineering point of view that are very interesting. Uh, there's a great, they offer a great opportunity for indie development uh, because there are sources of funding for some games to, 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 to make a game and then release it and distribute it, which is sometimes hard to do with other kinds of software products. Um, the game industry itself is very large, right? Three billion gamers were worldwide last year. Three billion, that, that's a lot of people playing games, right? It's just, it just boggles the mind how many people play games. I, I almost don't believe these numbers. Uh, and they're the biggest form of entertainment on the planet, more than sports and movies combined, right? Movies are a big industry. Sports are a big industry. If you add them together, the games are even, even larger, right? So the, it, it's a very, very big space to play in. Now, the goal of the lab itself is to accomplish 
basically three different thrusts. And so we have the courses that we're teaching, the game projects that we're making, and then some activities and outreach. So just to go through them quickly. So basically, our goal is to develop great games that we're going to release to the public, right? To get them out there so people get to know about UCSB, people get to know about what we do here, and so on. Uh, and it's probably the most important for us to get to get our, our, our stuff out there. Uh, but then as part of that also, we're, we've got uh, some activities and outreach, which basically help connect the UCSB game dev community together. Some of you may be in the game dev club, or, or, or it, sometimes some folks are in esports clubs and things like that. So we want to bring together folks that are interested in, in game development or gaming together and, and, and have activities like that, but also conduct outreach right to the next generation. So you guys are all college students, but I'm sure there's an eight year old out there who's maybe thinking about a career or not thinking about a career in STEM or engineering because you know they don't know much about game dev or whatever, but that'd be really cool to, to reach out. And then more importantly for you guys are the courses that we're teaching and this is why you're here hopefully. Uh, and so we have this multi-course sequence to increase game dev education at UCSB. So just to give you an idea for where this class fits into the curriculum. So we have this four course undergrad game dev sequence uh, that you may also have seen in the, in the back. I, I put these, these are, I think the, the, the placeholder numbers that they're going to give us, I think. Uh, they haven't been officially assigned. So right now they're like one I or, you know, P, U, and T or something like that. Uh, but anyway, the idea is we have this course in the spring and then followed by fall, winter, quarter of the following year of the advanced sequence. And I'm going to talk about what we do in this in this process. So in this class, right, this is the first class of the sequence. We're going to learn the basics of any game development. We're going to make four to five games during the course of this quarter. And it ends with this big final project, which will start and hopefully will be soon. Um, where we're going to basically have, uh, it, you guys are going to independently make uh, a fun game that gives us about 15 minutes of play. We'll talk about the specifics in a moment. Basically, then the idea is we're going to release these games for free through platforms like Hitchhot.io. And then in the advanced sequence, the idea is the students that do well in this class move on to the next sequence to form basically what I call like a dream team of students, right? Let's put together some of the best developers that have already made a great game on their own and put them together in teams of, let's say, 10 to 12 people and see what they can do together, right? And so work together as a team. So, uh, and in this case, the, the sequence itself is focused on various aspects of large-scale game development because when you start scaling up the software, it's not just simply one person times 12. There's a lot of infrastructure needed to work collaboratively, to communicate, and so on, right? And, and workflows and things like that. And the idea is to help students pre uh, uh, prepare the students to develop a high-end game that will be developed through the capstone sequence. Now, for various technical reasons, uh, we, uh, we're encouraging folks to take the capstone as well. Usually when you're taking this class, a lot of folks are juniors, and then they would be taking the seniors, and then we take the capstone. You don't have to take it this way, but the idea is that this is where the actual project would be graded. This is just teaching you how to work on the project for, for various reasons we can talk offline. So basically in the capstone, we would have, um, you know, actually be developing the game and have the, the you know, I'll be mentoring the project and so on, but basically I can show you the kind of projects that we're working on there. So we're currently in this class over here uh, and, um, and that's where it kind of fits into the larger sequence. Now, you may be looking at all this and thinking, okay, this looks all great and dandy, but what is it in for me, right? Like, what is it in for you guys, right? Like, why should you even care about the sequence? So allow me to talk a little bit about, more in detail about the kind of benefits and the reason that I'm teaching the sequence. Because I felt, you know, when I looked at our curriculum, like there were things that were missing, where I'm like, I wish students would learn this, 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 this by the time they graduated. And there were no courses that were offering that in ECE, CS, CE, or even other, other disciplines, right? And so that's kind of what I was trying to do with the sequence. So the first one is, um, you know, getting experience in product design. So none of our classes at UCSB, ECE, CS, data science, whatever, are really focusing on what I call product design, right? And so what that means is like you start with a blank slate and you create something of value, right? You're hired at Apple. They hire you and they're like, okay, you're going to run this next project. Go do something. Like, what do you do? Like you're given a blank slate and you have to create something of value. So how do you conceive the idea for your product, pitch the idea to get support, 
test and iterate on potential designs, spec out and implement the work to deliver on time, conduct user testing, and so on. These are all really critical parts of designing products. And yet, you know, and, and it's a huge part in industry, right? Particularly high tech is focused on designing actual products because that's kind of their business model, right? They're, they're, their whole, most companies have to do some kind of product. And, and so that's kind of their plan, right? And at UCSB, I mean, we have some classes that start trying to go towards that. For example, we have Capstone. But for 80% of the Capstone projects, usually you have some company, right, that approaches the students and says, hey, we have a, this problem. We need a video, you know, analyzer that does this, this, and this. And so they basically constrained your problem. So it stops being a product design thing and it becomes just an engineering, right? It's like just fix this problem, fill in the code to do this, right? And that we have plenty of experience for. I have no doubt that if I give you a snippet of thing and say, look, fill in the code that does this, you guys can all do that, right? So that's the typical engineering class we're used to. What I'm talking about here is starting with nothing and having to come up with something, right? And that's the challenge. And that's where students, what I found, students start struggling because they don't know how to do that, right? So capital projects usually are proposed by a company or mentor and are usually pretty specific. I know there's some room for exploration, right? And they're like, maybe I do it with a, this way and I do it that way. That's okay, right? It's not a freshman project. It's just, it's a, it's a you know, senior level project. I understand that. But it's as not as open as what you will find in the industry. So I've had a lot of kids go through the capstone and they go to industry and go, I was still not prepared for how it was because it's just too, too much of an empty slate. Right, you have to fill in too much stuff. So you usually, when when given such a what I call concrete project, you don't have to conceive the idea from scratch. You're basically finding a solution to already constrained problem, and this is kind of an engineering kind of thing, which I think we're all pretty good at uh, doing by now. So product design is going to be the key focus of our program, not only in this class but also in the advanced sequence. And so we are going to teach you how to take these blank slates. And in this case, develop a great game. But once you do it for games, you can do it for mobile devices or whatever, you know, robots, whatever you want to do. And that's the that's the objective, right? We're going to go through all the stages of product design from start to finish and teach you how to do this. The other thing, you know, benefit number two, right? The other reason that I wanted to do this class is that you know, video games are essentially pretty sophisticated software products, right? You know, and software and hardware engineering are the foundations of computing, right? We all need to really understand that really well. However, if you look at our programs, EEC, ECS, we don't usually emphasize real world software engineering, right? Uh, our students, they don't have a lot of experience, you know, in, in the typical EEC, EECS classes in writing big complex systems, right? Um, you know, for example, the E students, they only usually take up to CS16, so they don't even have object-oriented programming, which is like very minimal in my mind. CE students often just only take up to CS138, which is just basic data structures. And even on the CS side, you know, the class, the class that's closest to this is CS136, which I love that class, right? It's a great class, but it's not quite the okay, same, and you'll see why in a moment. Yeah. So it, most uh, projects in industry are big, complex code bases, right? When you go to Adobe or you go to Apple or you go to Microsoft or Intel or NVIDIA, you're going to have to deal with really large code bases, right? And so in our game dev program, we offer a way to get this experience in college, right? When you're in college, for example, in our games, I'm going to show you some of those, but Arcana is the game we're about to release. It's about 12,000 lines of code that the students have to manage. 300,000 files, 36 gigabytes for the project. It's it, These games can get sizable, right? And now when you're working with 12 people, it gets more complicated how to manage that, right? So our curriculum is very practical, teaching how to do this kind of real world software engineering. And we cover everything from the software design patterns, software development methodology, software architecture. And in this class in particular, we're gonna go through a lot of software design patterns for this large scale. Because what I found when I was teaching this class the first couple of times is that a lot of students did not know how to structure these very large programs. And therefore they would get stuck and have problems and things like that. So these are very important software engineering skills that I will argue, you know, even if you're not interested in software engineering, you want to have career in high tech, somehow to do with software, you better know these, right? The other one is wide scale release. This is actually really unintuitive at the beginning, but it, it's, it, I've, I've come to realize such an important aspect. 
So the typical courses that we take at UCSB don't emphasize kind of this idea of releasing the, the product to a large number of people. Let's define it by, let's say, 10,000 people or more, right? That's your target audience in this class. If you think about Capstone, right, Capstone, if they do have a customer, is usually a company, right? And uh, and basically, you're just giving the, 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 the project to them. And most of the time, I, I don't think I've ever seen this not happen. They treat that as a as a prototype demo, not as a shippable product. Usually, the students will deliver their final version. Their engineers will look at it and then just do it themselves, you know, and rewrite it. Uh, very rarely is it a shippable thing. Now, some people have tried to do startups from that, but then again, they may revise it for a final product. What we're interested here is in in producing shipping final code that's going to be shipped to ten thousand people. Or more. Right. That's a diff that's a fundamentally different piece than anything most students have done before. Um, even in CS one six, where it is about real world software engineering, they usually don't have such a large audience. Usually, it's in the order of like hundreds or thousands of people are checking out the code or or accessing it or using the product, not tens of thousands. And so, you know, when you're not kind of releasing in such a wide scale, you're not learning how to create things like marketing plans, bringing a product to market, the user testing, all this stuff is completely foreign. And why wait till you go to NVIDIA or Apple or Google and start doing that and learning that? You might as well learn that here. Um, and because in industry, wide scale release is obviously very common, right? That's, that's their whole objective is they're trying to reach a lot of people with their stuff. And so working with a pro and, and, and this is actually really funny. You might think that, that, well, so what's the big deal, right? It's no different. It's the same thing that I've always done. Just you, you, you say it launch and you launch it to more people. I will argue that when you work on a project with wide scale release, it requires a fundamentally different mindset from the get go. And that's why I'm telling you this, because I want you to change your attitude in day one of how you're going to approach this class, because this class is going to be different. Like I said at the beginning, this class is going to be nothing like the other classes. You're going to have to have a different mindset uh, when you're working on something that is, has a wide, wide scale release versus on something that no one will ever see, which is the typical class project, right? So the analogy that I like to make is like, imagine this, cooking, right? Cooking for just yourself one evening or cooking for a large dinner party, right? Are these, do you approach these the same way? No, right? No. They could not be more different. They're both cooking. Right, sure, they're both coding or whatever, right? But but when you code for just yourself or just to submit so the TA looks at it, it's fundamentally different than if you code and 10,000 people are gonna be playing your code, right? Some kid in Sweden is gonna be emailing you saying, hey, I can't get the platform to work, right? So you approach them in fundamentally different ways. So when you're cooking for yourself, right? You might just grab something quick, throw in the microwave, and this is how you, how you eat, right? <laughs> Uh, when you're cooking by yourself. And then when you're cooking for a dinner party, you take your time, you do all the ingredients, you take you, you, the quality, right? And then you serve it in a fundamentally different way. And the reason that you do that is in the first one, right? You know, nobody's gonna, no, nobody's gonna see it, nobody cares. You just want the simplest thing to get the thing done. This is what I see in 99% of the courses when I teach class and I have a final project, but the kids know that only the TA is gonna see it, or maybe I look at it if you're lucky. What do I get? I get TV dinner at Cohorts, right? Just the, they do the bare minimum they can to just get it in the door and, and get an A or whatever grade they want, right? That just, just tell me what, just tell me the minimum that I need to do to get that. And, and, and that makes sense, right? I would do the same thing because we're not going to spend a lot of time if this is what's going to happen. But when is this scenario, then now people are going to be judging you. They're going to be thinking about you. They're going to be weighing your contribution and saying, was that game good or did it suck? Your name is now on the line, right? You, your reputation and things like that. You, you, you care how people think about you, right? You want to impress. This is why you don't just break out a bunch of microwave TV dinners and serve them because you'd look like a, like a dumbass, right? At this kind of thing. You want to impress. And I noticed the same thing in the class. When I tell the kids at the beginning, look, this game, well, we will release it. I'll talk about that in a moment. And UCSB is going to start marketing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, put, put the time in to think about what you're going to do because it's going to change the kind of project that you're going to do now that you're thinking in that way. So the way you work on a project that's going to be seen by 10,000 people plus is very different than 
a project that you work uh, only to show the TA or a professor if you're lucky, right? Uh, when you know your code will be widely re uh, released, you architect it differently, you write it differently, you test it differently, quality goes way up. When I taught a version of this class back in UNM, before I would do public releases, we'd get some pretty crappy games. People were just again, doing the minimum just to get by. And then one time I'm like, let me try it, because at that point, point XNA had a storefront. And I'm like, let me tell the students we're going to release them at XNA. That was the only difference, right? I said the same material, the same lectures, the same homework assignments. The only thing that changed, I told the students, at the end of the quarter, we're going to post your games up here. And they're like, oh, crap. <laughs> and the quality went way up, right? Most of the stuff is psychological anyway, right? So by changing your mindset, it changes how you go about it. Um, and sadly, most of our students are missing this experience because most of the projects that we do at UCSB never see the light of day, right? You, just, you know, because also nobody cares about that, right? Like I, when I was an undergrad, I worked on a great compiler project. What am I going to do, right? Put it on my website, who's going to look at it? Nobody cares, right? Nobody cares. Uh, operating system, whatever, in graphics, we do a rendering system, right? Which is super cool. I, I love it. But, you know, the student puts it on their webpage, but nobody's really going to look at it. You know, maybe they get like 10 downloads, right? But they're not going to get 10,000, right? Because it's just, you know, the scale of, of attention is just completely different. So this is what game development offers, right? Our games are designed and to be to be released on these major platforms, right? And it it uh, no not only does it teach you about how to release and market a product, but it also and this is also part of the important thing. It gives you guys visibility, right? Part of the goal is to you know you're junior seniors, you're about to graduate. Let's say you want to come out to the world, go look. Here's what I'm doing, right? You want to get some recognition for what you're doing. Another benefit, I'll wrap these up quick and then we can get into the meat of the stuff. Um, working on a larger team. So again, most of real world engineering is done in teams of six to 20 people. Um, whereas in UCSB, in most ECS uh, classes, most of the things are individual, but if there are group projects, it's usually four people or fewer, right? Like it's usually groups of three, that kind of thing. Why? Because scaling groups is really hard. It's really got hard for the teachers. It's really hard for um, the TAs. It's, it's just hard production-wise, right? And so this class is going to be very different. Uh, first of all, in, in this class, we'll work on an individual project because I want everybody to have gone through the process themselves. But in the advanced class, it has to be run very differently, much more like a like a like a like a like an industry kind of uh, environment. So Capstone sometimes has large teams, right? We've had like the Hyperloop project and so on that has maybe 10, 12, you know. 15 people, right? Uh, but that's relatively rare. It's not the, it's the exception, not the rule. Um, so overall, I, I find just looking at the curriculum, the students are missing, you know, the experience of working in large groups with proper management hierarchies, entirely staffed by students, right? right? Usually if we have a group project, it's the, you know, the TAs or the, you know, the uh, faculty members as that is basically the project manager or something like that. And we don't want that. We want the students to actually, there's students over here too. Uh, we want the students to actually have that experience. So without this, right, you're not getting exposed to stuff like how to manage others, communicating, working large teams, the latter version control. So simple things I like get. I know in 1P6, they talk a lot about it because that's a, also a group environment. But here we, we stress that a lot. Um, even like agile version control and stuff, which they don't, I feel, I feel development, which they don't talk about, which we, we do. Uh, it's really important. Uh, gathering feedback, sharing control, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of stuff there that, that's really important. Um, and again, um, in our basic, uh, in our, I'm sorry, the game dev class, we have large team projects, right? Uh, our last big game that we're going to hopefully ship in the summer has uh, 10 students on the team uh, and they have actual roles and responsibilities. So what's a game designer, art director, whatever, you know, they're, they're all kind of working in the hierarchy. Uh, and they're learning to, you know, run the meetings and coordinate and stuff like that. And so they're getting kind of this real world teamwork experience. And then finally, uh, I, I think this is really important because the world, the workplaces, when I talk to my friends at Google or NVIDIA or Microsoft, they want diverse set of people. By diverse, I don't mean also just racially or gender wise or whatever. I also mean like in terms of their background, people who have more of a art background that are doing more programming or programmers that are doing more art or that have aesthetic design background and things like that. And so they're looking for engineers that can work with people with different fields, different things. Uh, and unfortunately, again, the ECS classes where it's pretty homogeneous, right? Usually, I bet you 99% of your classes have been basically engineering students. 
or maybe you know some physics, math, data science people sprinkled in, but that's basically it. And so there's not a lot of exposure and alternate ways of thinking, different ways to do that, and so on. So in this class, I'm drawing a lot from the art community and the way the art students do classes right over there, which means a lot of uh, you know feedback sessions, interaction, and so on, because that's how you do those kinds of things. And and it's really critical for product design, right? Which is more closer to the arts than engineering, but we're going to take it from the engineering side. So um, our students in, in, in the typical EECS kind of, kind of areas, we mostly stay in, in comfort zones, right? Which is unlike the real world. So the idea for this class is to really, um, you know, require you to understand a bit about engineering, a bit about art, right? Because, uh, you know, as we get into the project, uh, there, there'll be a lot of folks who, who don't have a lot of sense in aesthetic design and things like that. And so when I look at their interfaces, their user interfaces, their, their just the layout of stuff, it's going to be terrible. And they're going to have to learn how to fix those things. Because part of the uh, part of the deal is that you're creating something to be used by people. So it better be friendly, approachable, understandable, et cetera. Right? That's part of the process. And so that we're not only going to cover the technical aspects of game development, but also aesthetics, art, design, things like that. And... Uh, in the capstone, in the, I'm sorry, the advanced sequence, uh, work with artists or use artistic tools to do high quality artwork. For example, right now we're working for Arcana, we're working with artists to make the Steam homepage and all that, the Steam capsules and all this. So again, that's the way the real world is, right? You need to learn how to work with this person because you need to deliver you know, the product and not only the iPhone, but the advertising for the iPhone and everything like that, right? So it's part of the, part of the way of the world. And again, no, no other program is really doing this. The only exception I can think of is MAT, which kind of does straddle a lot of art and engineering very well together. But this is what we're designed to do. So in summary, you know, if you're thinking like, why should I even care about these classes? You know, again, we're going to learn the fundamentals of product design, which is super important. We're going to get our software engineering skills to an industry level. Sorry, I forgot the industry level. Uh, gives experience with a wide scale release of products to the public, which I think is very important. Hands-on experience of working with larger teams if you do the advanced course, and then forces you to leave this engineering comfort zone to learn about other things that are also important. Um, and so it could be a potential game changer for your career if you want to work in high tech. And we're going to do all these things by using the excuse of making games, right? So when people say, well, make games, what's the point? This is, this is what you can think about. This is what you can answer. All right, uh, I've been going pretty fast. So are there any questions about any of this? I know it's kind of high level, so probably there may not be. Yeah. So in the intro class, how much of the collaboration are we going to do as we make games? So the games are going to be individual, but you're going to be broken up into cohorts. I'm going to talk about them in a moment. And so the cohort's going to be a group of students, uh, five or six together, and you're going to form a little mini team where each of you is going to be working on a game and together, uh, you will be giving feedback and and uh, ideas and back and forth between your cohort uh, quite regularly, actually. The way we're going to do it is we're going to break up. So again, this class is completely different than the typical class. Uh, it's it's much longer, first of all, an hour and 15 minutes. So what we're going to do, uh, once things get going, not, probably not this week, but next week, we're going to have one hour of the lecture in the, in the beginning. But then for the remainder of the time, we're going to break out into our groups and go over the stuff specifically for your project so you could be getting feedback so you're going to learn how to you know work together to get feedback and so on and that's going to also develop a structure for them when you go to the if you if you do go on to the advanced sequence you'll have that in place where you can do that yeah great question any other questions yes which platform are we like for this like steam or something uh so for the for the intro class we're targeting like free platforms so like something like itch.io and stuff so Itch, if you're familiar, itch.io is more for like indie games, kind of, you know, good, good basic games. So I think if we can do that, Steam is still a possibility, but we'd have to kind of think about that later after the class and depends on the quality of the thing. Because Steam is actually quite a high uh, bar, bar for, for having a good game there. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Okay. So let's let's go over the curriculum a little bit, and because uh, I've told you, you know, what's the, the the motivation, right? I've given you the motivation, like why why do this? Now let's go into a little bit nuts and bolts of what you're going to be learning and things like that. So, like I said, the the curriculum is broken up into these four classes: once the intro and then three are the advanced sequence, 
So let's go through the intro class, which is this one, right? So you're going to learn everything you need to know to develop a short, fun game entirely on your own, which is this final project, right? And I've already been touching on this, so I'll go kind of quickly, but basically product design stuff, game design stuff, uh, including today, we're going to start talking about what a game is, what makes it fun, and things like that. Um, we're going to go, again, this class is, there's a lot to touch on, right? So we're going to be ping-ponging back and forth between a game design topic, maybe a software engineering topic, maybe a Unity topic, right? And we're going to kind of go through those different things. Um, then software engineering stuff, right? How do you build large scale systems? How do you make sure that uh, we have performance and things like that? As well as some Unity stuff. Uh, a lot of the Unity stuff will be in the discussion sections on, on Fridays. But basically there's a lot to cover in one quarter, I'll be honest, right? And so uh, this is why this is a five unit class. Uh, there's gonna be almost four hours of lecture and two hours of lab or discussion section per week because there's a lot involved in this. Uh, but by the end of the course, students have made some pretty fun games. And let me just show you, you probably have played some of these, hopefully. This one is called, uh, let me just lower the volume. This is a game by uh, one of the tutors for this class, actually, Nicholas, or Nate. Um, so he's got this shmup game uh, where you, you play the role of this dragon rider and you're controlling your dragon. But at some point in the game, it switches to this mode where you have like all the 3D targeting. You're facing uh, different opponents like boss uh, dragons and so on. Okay, uh, we've got this one here, for example. This one is so, so students can make all kinds of games. Uh, that Dragon Rider, as you saw, was, uh, was uh, let me just lower the volume here. It's just a little loud. That uh, Dragon Rider was a kind of a swap game. This is a third person action game uh, where you're fighting your way through a bunch of levels to defeat, like, uh, I guess in this case, uh, you know, Satan is at the end or something like that. Uh, this is a first-person shooter. Uh, again, students can make any kind of genre they want. Uh, uh, this one is a, a third-person action game. Kind of a samurai theme. And a bunch of these games are available on that uh, Frequently Asked Questions site where you can yourself try them. I would really recommend or strongly recommend that you guys go through and play some of these games to get an idea in your head of what my expectation is for the class. It's not like all those are A projects, but I'm showing you here's what students are doing just in the last few quarters and, and what I'd be expecting your game to sort of be like. Uh, this is another um, kind of a fighting game. Again, you're free to sort of, uh, you know, come up with your own plot of the game, your own ideas of what kind of game you want to make. Um, this one is, um, this one's more like a, like a, like a resource management, real time strategy kind of game where you are uh, trying to defend this farm from these uh, incoming like plants that are attacking it. And so you gotta like move your little assets around to protect. And then during the, during the waves, between the waves, you basically build more units and stuff like that. This one is a puzzle game that's kind of like a puzzle horror game. Uh, you're walking around and you're solving these kind of mysteries. Um, it's supposed to be, um, you know, kind of a, one of these like uh, mist-like 
games where you're kind of uh, trying to solve some riddles and things. There's like markings on the wall and you have to figure out what, what do they say and stuff like that and figure out the code. Uh, we also have folks that make games for more for kids, right? So in this case, it's a game to teach kids the difference between recycle and garbage. And so we have this trash picking robot that goes around and picks up garbage. And you know, you have to do it in a certain amount of time, and people are dropping garbage, and you have to quickly then bin them into your appropriate containers and so on. All right, so those are some sample games, but there's a whole list on the uh, frequently asked questions. So if you go to the, um, let me show you. Get my real quicker here. Um, if you've been here and you go down uh, and you can see uh, like a bunch of games there for you to download, right? Uh, and I'd art, before we put, this class is games up on Instagram. We're going to go through and start putting up these. And I'll talk about sort of some of the legal things that we've been wrestling with UCSB, but finally these have been worked out. So we're going to start putting these out there in the correct places. Yes. So you can pull them Yeah, these are all the classes. classes. These are all the classes. Yeah. So by the end of this class, you'll have hopefully something like these games. Yes. And then, um, and then let's talk about the advanced sequence, uh, which is. Um, yeah, the advanced sequence, which basically it's the first time where you're really, like I said, working with a large team, uh, 10 to 12, and each of the sides that I'm looking for. And we're going to be doing a lot of things like agile software development, right? We use from uh, large, large you know, version control, which some of you have started using. I'm sorry, I think it's 156, not 154. Is it 156? Does anybody know? 156 or 154? I think it's 156, right? Yeah, there's a typo. And uh, communication in in uh, you know workflows and large teams, asset management and stuff like that. We need to kind of go through all that stuff. Um, and each class, like I said, there were three classes, right? Each one is a different stage of game development. So, for example, for the first class, of Neuromancer, this is one of our uh, folks that are going to be helping out with this class, Matteo. He's he was the game lead for Neuromancer, and so in the first class, we're basically just doing some kind of rough. Uh, prototyping, we're trying to figure out the mechanics, uh, laying out stuff, trying to understand what the game is like, building basically a basic prototype. And then we begin to flesh it out, you know, create the world, start planning out the, the different levels and dungeons and things like that. And in the third class, it's really about getting everything together and polishing it out and getting the game out. So let me show you some examples. So the ones that I just showed you were the interclass. Now these are the advanced sequence where now you have like 10 people working for a year on it, right? So you, the comparison is one person working for six to seven weeks versus now a team of 10 working for, um, you know, almost a year. So the first game that we're gonna release soon is Arcana. That's basically on the shelf where we're just waiting for all the legal uh, processes to, to work their way through UCB. Uh, it's a third person action game uh, where you play the role of a mage and it's a roguelite. So you get to decide what skill tree you want to develop. So what kind of mage you want to be. Um, and so you can, for example, choose fire, or ice, or arcane magic. And you're basically trying to optimize your build through the through the run, so to speak, right? As, as a typical roguelite. And so you've got these different levels with uh, lots of uh, enemies. Uh, and then you can, you can choose your power ups and stuff like that. As your rank goes up, obviously the, the spells become much more powerful. And so the idea for this game was really to have a power fantasy kind of uh, third person action game. Um, this is uh, one of the middle levels there. There are basically three main lands in this game. Uh, this is uh, the middle one. Uh, these games are supposed to provide about 10 hours of play, right? But the idea is these games are gonna be for sale. Right on Steam. So if you're gonna sell something for like a dollar or a couple bucks, right, you better get at least 10, 10 at least 10 hours of play out of that. Uh, and so that's the goal. So um, let's see. So yeah, so you fight your way through it, and then I think you're gonna show some of the bosses and stuff. Yeah, these are some of the bosses in the different levels and stuff. This is the final boss here. 
So that's going to be hopefully released. Uh, we're going to set up the, we're in the process of setting up the Steam page. Hopefully that'll go live really soon and, and get that out. And then Neuromancer is the, is the so we've, we've done now at UCSB um, four big games like this. So we did uh, Lux was the first one, but Lux is only a smaller team, like five people or so. That's probably going to go on Inch.io one sec. It's weird. Uh, then Arcana, uh, which will be out on Steam hopefully soon. Neuromancer will be out later this summer, hopefully. Uh, it's basically done. We're just adding a few levels and adding more content and things like that. But basically in this game, this is also a magic game. Kids like magic. But basically in this one is you're like this little weak wizard with no magical power other than the fact that you control creatures. And so you can target uh, enemies and then possess them and have them do stuff. And so you're walking around these dungeon levels, uh, solving puzzles and getting around obstacles and fighting enemies and bosses just by controlling your allies, right? The, the best creatures. So basically, you take over the monsters and, and you die. There are a lot of like typical like puzzles that you find in these where you have to like step on a platform and you have to figure out how to flip the switch by controlling your allies to to uh, to overcome the 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 obstacles in the way. So we hope to release that again at the end of summer. Okay. Uh, any questions about the program in general before we get into the logistics of the class? Okay. So class logistics. First of all, we've got a pretty big class, lots of kids in this class, about 60 in the class. So we're going to have a large teaching team uh, this time. So there's there's me, the instructor, for each then. Uh, we've got two TAs, uh, Shaw and Aditya, who's here. Uh, and uh, so Shaw has uh, quite a bit of experience in game level design and in particular generative uh, levels. That's a procedural level generation uh, in Unity and Unreal. And her background herself is in product design, which I really like people who are coming in with a product design background because they understand the ins and outs of putting together stuff. Like I said, life slave and figuring out the the processes in place to make sure that you're successful. And then Avitya um, is a is a PhD student here at the NCE, and he was a former game developer at a studio in India. So he's worked also on some games uh, using Unity, right? <laughs> Unity games. Then we also have uh, two tutors in the class. Uh, these are we have to use different names for legal reasons. So PAs are grad students, tutors are undergrad students, but they're pretty experienced. So these tutors have both worked on multiple games through the program. So uh, Nick did the Dragon Rider game that I showed earlier, uh, and he worked on Arcana, and he did various uh, things in Arcana and one of the leads towards the end. Uh, Alan uh, did Batty's Inc. in the intro class, and then um, in, in he's worked on a couple of, of the advanced games as well, Neuromancer and Grignards as well. So I'm glad to have them on board because they'll provide a lot of sort of like experience from somebody who's already been through it, right? And going through what they're going through uh, this time. We also have a couple of folks that I'm happy to have them uh, help out. These, I call them the brain trust. So these are folks that were game leads for one of the major games that we just saw. For example, uh, Mateo was the game lead for Neuromancer. Uh, Zach uh, is the game lead for Grid Merch. This is our latest game, probably will be released in the fall, I'm thinking. Uh, so we're, like you said, we're like a company, we're kind of like producing games and kind of leapfrogging from one game to the next, right? And so he's the game lead for that, but he was a tech lead for a Neuromancer and did another game also for the class. So we've got quite a few people that are that are uh, part of that. And then we also have some other senior mentors. These are just a couple that I can name now, but we've got uh, Richard, who is a UCSB faculty in CS. He's really experienced in game development and he, he just wants to be part of the program. And I told him he could be a senior mentor. These folks will drop in in some of the classes and also see some of the cohorts groups and work with you guys on various things, give feedback and so on. And also, as on a former student who is now a Blizzard, Activision is actually in town, will be coming by a few times and give you some feedback and things like that. 
Um, there's a few others that uh, that also will probably be coming, but these are the folks that are probably going to be the most involved in the class. Um, any questions about that so far? Okay, so now let's start getting into the. Somebody's way. Let's get a little bit low level uh, and start looking at things like uh, the syllabus. Uh, so, so let me just quickly do that. Uh, in the meantime, I'll take any questions if there are any questions. Um, I wanted to get all this stuff, but with the, we're migrating from Gaucho space to Canvas, and so a lot of things have broken. Uh, and so I apologize that we're just running a little bit behind in getting some of this content out, uh, but I will post it in the next day or two. I was just emailing you guys uh, all the critical stuff, like like uh, the homework zero asteroids, uh, the, the the project one, the three pitches and stuff, so you can get started with that. Um, let me go ahead and sorry. Um, Okay, this is the syllabus. I've adapted it from last year, so some stuff is still broken. I apologize in advance. I'm still working on it to finalize it. Oops, hello. Sorry, it's, it's uh, there we go. Okay, so, oops, I don't know why it keeps doing that. Here, all right, so welcome to 184. Uh, we're going to have things like homework assignments, lectures, final projects, and so on. We'll get into more detail on that. Uh, like I've been saying, this class is fundamentally different because it, it is a lot of work. I'll be honest, right? I say about 15 to 20 hours per week, right? You see how ambitious we're trying to be? Uh, but a lot of folks say that it's really worth it because it's the first class where they kind of do this for the first time and go through that. And then they're going to companies and they're like, wow. Because I took that class, I have a much easier way at, you know, wherever they went. Uh, and not just game companies, but any any kind of company. Um, we're also going to have lots of in-class discussion, peer group feedback, and other kinds of interaction that doesn't happen in typical engineering classes. Typical engineering classes, you do your homework, you submit it, nobody else sees it, nobody else talks about it, it's your, your, your private thing, right? Here, this is a lot more like a liberal arts class where you do stuff, and then we got to talk about it. To, to, to get feedback, to get everybody thinking about it, to, and so on, right? So there's a lot more sharing in this class than because of, uh, it's the nature of product design, right? We need to talk about the stuff. Um, all right, so that's uh, that's the setup. Uh, any, any questions about that? Okay, these are the folks, it's the same folks that you saw in the last slide. I just have to fill in all their information. I, I'm missing these things called mentor hours. I'll describe that in a moment. But basically these are the folks. Um, okay, mentor hours. Um, so here's the way it's going to work. Um, we're going to need to meet with you guys one on one to discuss your project, right? And look at how many kids there are in the class. Look how few of us there are. It's three, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to set up these hours. For example, a DPI and Shaw have offered 10 hours each, okay, uh, that you're going to sign up for. And these are called uh, mentor hours. They're one-on-one -on -one meetings to discuss a specific project. Now, they're not private meetings. People can also join, okay? And we'll do most of this communication via Discord. Okay, I'm gonna set up some Discord channels. So basically, uh, let's say you sign up for Tuesday at 11 a.m. You go online with Aditya, right, on Discord. And that's where you get to talk about your project and your ideas and what you're trying to do and the problems you're having, okay? So it has to be a pretty compact half hour session. But we're going to do three of those. You're going to get three of those every two weeks, right? Because we need to be giving you feedback, okay? And you're going to be showing us your latest build and, you know, talking about some design choices and so on. Does that make sense? And then, um, so uh, we'll schedule in advance. We'll have some Google Suite. We're going to have a fair group of uh, And then um, you're going to schedule this. And basically the idea is we have... So many people in our teaching team that I want you to make sure you're talking to different people to get different ideas and different feedback as well. It's really important to throw that, okay? Um, and then these are not private meetings because other students are welcome to join. So but please don't talk about private stuff. This is just about your project and making it better. Any questions about that? Is that cool? Um, and then to communicate with us, so we set up this uh, EC184 uh, email alias. Uh, let me see if I can make that even a little bigger here. 
I guess I can make it. Okay, sorry, it's it's a little hard to make it any bigger. So, um, Edita, you got the email that I sent to this alias? Um, if you could check. Uh, so this should be an email later that our co-op is working. But basically, for private questions like, oh, my uh, grandmother died, I can't make this thing, whatever, email that. And then that way, one of us can, can address your question. Uh, but for general questions like, where do I get this asset? Or I can't. You know, for this project, what should I do? Or this assignment, what should I do? Or I can't find the the, the files for this. Uh, please post them on the on the main Discord forum. So we're going to do most of the stuff in the Discord. Discord, we'll see how that goes. Uh, and so please post it there because there could be you know twenty other kids who have the same question as you, right? So we want to answer one more question once and have an answer for everybody. Uh, all right, is that cool? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't set up the server yet, um, so I need to do that. Yeah, yeah some of it's like we're, we're literally putting it all together because the cameras and so on. Uh, I'll set it up probably today or tomorrow. Um, so we have our main lectures, 12 to 150. That's what we're in today. Um, at the beginning, like this week, for example, it mostly be like there's lots to start covering. But probably starting next week, we'll start doing the half and half where we do lecture and then we'll do the breakout session where we start talking about in this case your pitch ideas right then then we pitch and we start discussing them with each other and then there's discussion sections uh from 9 to 10 50 on fridays and these are for the first four they're going to be tutorial sections on how to use the i found a lot of kids right even though i said go do those tutorials online and stuff a lot of folks haven't done them uh, at least if you can do so, the more prepared you are, the better. Uh, but we still have to teach you some stuff on how to do things. So the TAs or the tutors, I'm sorry, will work you through a series of little exercises to do things and you need to learn how to do stuff, right? So like little low level stuff. But then after a certain week, uh, I think it's starting week five, those will basically turn into project discussion sessions where you will be meeting with your cohort and going into more depth in the discussion of your project, right? Because this class really quickly, it, you know, it has two parts. The first part is getting you familiar with Unity and getting a few games under your belt. And then we transition 100% to working on this game and making the best game you can in those three and six weeks. Okay. Um, so the lectures will be in person. You guys got to come. Uh, I'm only going to record maybe the first week or so for people who are on the wait list who, who, who don't have a guaranteed spot in the classroom. But hopefully by the end of the week, things are stabilized and we know who's in and who's not. Uh, the discussion sections, uh, a lot of folks in the past say, well, I have my desktop where I have Unity. I can't use it on my little laptop, so I can't come in class. That's fine. We'll try to stream those on Discord as well. And uh, and then we'll, um, we'll, uh, we'll stream those so you can follow along in, at home, right? Just, just watching the, the, the Discord thing. Uh, all right, so that's the 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 way those things work. Um, there's a lot to cover, right? Again, these are things I've already said, but basically we got to cover game design stuff, uh, large scale engineering, whatever, blah, blah, blah. We already talked about that. Um, discussion sections are mandatory. So all of this mandatory, right? You guys have to come to class. If you guys are not coming to class, this class will not work. Because if we have 60 kids at home, working on their projects, not talking to each other, not talking to us, we're going to get 60 crappy games, or 55 crappy games, right? And, and we don't want that. We want every one of you to be successful. Every one of you to have a game up on each side or showing my page is what I did. Go hire me, right? So that's what we want. You guys need to be here. We need to be talking, okay? And part of the requirement is when we transition to the, to the breakout sessions, you'll have to be giving feedback and notes through the Discord channel to your teammates, right? And your teammates need to be writing it up as well. So that's how we'll know who's who's here and who's not. We're not gonna take attendance, right? We're not elementary school, but you'll be needing to give notes on what they presented, right? And if you're not here, you know, you can't give notes, right? And that's gonna be part of your grade. Um, so these cohort groups, sorry, I'm still working on some of the text, but basically the idea is we're gonna break up the class into 10 groups. 10 groups, if we have around 60 people, there's gonna be five to six people in each group. Okay, that's your cohort. Okay, you're gonna be assigned a group. 
I'm going to try to be evenly distributed so that they're all roughly the same statistically equivalent, right? We're going to get you. So you're going to be you and five other students working on a total of six games, right? And that's going to be your team. And you're going to be talking to each other, giving each other feedback, working with each other throughout the quarter to ensure that all of the projects in your cohort are as good as possible. Because part of your grade will depend on everybody in the cohort. Yeah. Not a big part, but part of it. Okay. The bulk is obviously your project, but it also matters how your other teammates do. Like a real company, right? In a real company, it's not just the success of your product and who cares about everything else at Apple. Everything depends on everybody, right? So this class is a little bit different than that one. Okay. Uh, we'll assign the core groups probably uh, sometime this week so that we start settling by the end of the week once we know that because people are adding, dropping, whatever, right? Or some transition. But once we know who's in, we know the cohorts, we'll set it up. Okay. Any questions about that? So the idea is we'll do the session. And then at some point I'll be like, okay, lecture's done, uh, break out into cohorts. And we'll, I'll have a map. We, we got it planned out. So six tables over here, six chairs over here. Six, you know, we'll just kind of quickly break the point into our little groups and get started with the discussion. And we'll be going around helping you lead it and stuff like that, but we'll tell you exactly what we're trying to get out of this session. Okay. Make sense. All right. Uh, this class is, is remarkably uh, complicated um, because there's a lot of infrastructure that we can talk about and lots of things to deal with. So um, Canvas will be used for major communications once I get that set up. I used to use Gaucho Space, now we're really Canvas. So I'll set up the, I'm not gonna have a class one there. That's gonna be really nice for it. It's gonna be just a major communications like announcements. I'll broadcast through that. Uh, I'll post the assignments and lectures there so we can access them and stuff like that, okay? It's your way to get stuff from me. When I post my lecture, it will be there, right? When I post stuff, it will be there. Uh, if you need to get access, please email me uh, or email the teaching team uh, because some folks are not signed up through Gold. They're on uh, extension and they don't get automatically added or whatever, right? So please let, me, let us know. Um, the Zoom stuff, this is from last time. I think we're going to move entirely to Discord. Is that correct? We can do everything we can do in Zoom and Discord, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not I'm not a big user of Discord, but I know that a lot of folks are using it. And there's certainly a lot of the young folks playing games are using it. So I know you can stream games through it and talk over them. So that's exactly what we need in this class. So we'll probably move the bulk of stuff on Discord. And we're going to set up the Discord server to have channels for each of the cohorts. And so on Fridays, you know, once the discussion sections are over in terms of the tutorials, and now it's all a discussion, you're just going to jump right into the discussion and going forward and start talking about the games and stuff like that, right? Uh, we're going to have a Google Drive that we set up that we're going to share. We need to share lots of stuff with you guys, like assets and files and so on. There's a bunch of things in the Google Drive. I'll make that live for you guys at some point. We also use Box. <laughs> so this class is complicated because, uh, look, we're going to need to upload stuff for the deadlines, right? Like there are three pitches, right? We need to upload them somewhere. In one of the first iterations of the class, I used to use Gaucho Space to do all the deliverables, but, but it's a pain in the butt because like the moment you upload it, I need to share it with the rest of the class, you know, because everybody has to be able to read everybody's ideas and talk about them and give feedback and play test. You can't do that with, can with Canvas or Gaucho Space and it becomes really difficult to upload these huge files and stuff. So we're going to do everything through Vox, where you upload, we're going to create an upload only directory. You upload there for the deadline. And then after the deadline, we just flip the switch and make it readable by the class. And then you can read it and access it, you know, and then you can, for example, download everybody in your cohorts as uh, pitches and you can look at them and, and so on. Does that make sense? So we'll, we'll, we may have to rank some of those things like cluster them and stuff like that. Um, so let's, uh, and it might be a good idea to basically put the cohort number at the beginning. I'm just thinking. Yeah. Just to make it easy, because in the back end, if you got 60 things, we have to sort through them and group them into cohorts, might be a little bit of a problem. Uh, so some of these things will will let you know how to how to name them and stuff like that. Uh, this class is really important that we stick to conventions. So whatever I say, unless I change it, uh, we have to stick to that. So when, when I say name your project this way, name your file this way, I don't want to see another name because it creates a lot of headaches in the back end when you know I said name it, you know this this this, and you named it. My homework three pitches three final. You know, then I don't know who it is, like what cord you're in, all that stuff, right? So we're probably gonna have to come up with really tight specifications of how you're submitting stuff. 
so that people can access it quickly and efficiently. Just like in a company, right? You have to name things properly, otherwise you're not going to work. Um, all right, any question about this kind of infrastructure? Is that cool? So once you get the thing, you can read through it. Um, Slack, we probably, I set up a Slack, but we're probably not going to use it. We're probably going to go to Discord for the entire thing, I believe, right? We can do everything. So we may not use Slack. Uh, this might be a, a sound. And then obviously Unity 3D, which is what we're going to be building our games in. Often I get the question, why not use Unreal, right? Or some other engine, Godot or whatever. Uh, look, there's a lot of engines out there, right? So we had to choose one. And obviously I'd like everybody to be using the same one because it's much easier to share assets, to work, to play test if we're all using the same thing. Now, things like Unreal, Unreal is very powerful. And it's something that I'm really thinking about using it maybe for the advanced sequence. But one challenge is how do you find assets or get artwork that's going to live up to that engine's potential? It's really hard. And honestly, as good, you know, maybe some of you are talented artists, but we're not professional artists. I, or I don't think anybody here is a professional artist. And there's a difference between programmers who are pretty good artists and professional artists, right? There's just a whole other level of quality and things. And so what I, the, the, I made a decision to say, let's simplify our lives and use things like existing uh, libraries that we have assets and things like that. And the, the, the Unity Asset Library is really good. and has a lot of stuff. Let's simplify our life and do the easier thing so that we can focus on making great games, right? And as you saw from the games we showed, you can get pretty good games with these assets and things like that. Okay? So it's not a, not a major problem. Uh, and so that's what Unity seemed like a good choice as, as, a, as an introductory class uh, learning game engine. Okay? So this is very important, though. You need to install the same version of Unity. Okay, that we have. I cannot stress this enough. So if you go to this uh, frequently asked questions, does everybody have access to this fact, right? Please let me know if you don't have access. Uh, and you go to, sorry, it's long, but there's a lot to talk about, right? But you go, um, yeah, this is really getting started in Unity. This one here, the version we're going to be using, let me just magnify this. Sorry, it's a little small. Plus, 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 plus. We are going to be using the LTS with long-term support. That's what that means. Uh, 2022.3.22.1. If you're said, oh, I'm using F3 or what, some other number, I don't know. You have to use this one. Why? Because stuff's not going to work. You're going to give your game to somebody else on your team to look at or look, do some code review. They're not going to be able to open it. They're not going to be able to load it. They're not going to be able to use it. You're not going to be able to use some of the stuff that we give you. It's going to be a big pain in the butt. Every year, I, I'll say this, but every year I get a student like in week six going, oh, I'm building my game, but I'm using a different version. I'm like, dude, you have to go back and do everything you've done quickly, but you got to redo it on this version because we can't play test it. We can't do this. We can't do that. We can't do this because you're doing using a random version. And yes, Unity in theory supports the ability to like suck in the project from another type and bring it to this type, but lots of things break in the process. So students have found that it's often easier to start from scratch and then just add everything manually, right? And they spend like a week doing that. What a what a waste of a week because they need to pay attention to the number. So make sure you're using the right number. Does that make sense to everybody? Just because we all need to be on the same page, just like a real company, right? We say in this class, here's what we're going to use. Last year we used a different number, right? The previous one. But this is the current one that's there saying it's supported, so we're going to use this one. Okay, cool. And then you can work, you can go through the rest of this that gives you sort of, you know, uh, some tips on how to get started. Um, all right, let's get into the more interesting things uh, or more salient things. Everybody wants to know how this is graded and all this. Uh, some of this is still, let me see, I think I changed it, but basically the breakdown. So we've got, what, what do we have in this class? We've got um, homework assignments. We're going to have three homework assignments. We're going to have some stuff for the discussion sections. We're going to have uh, stuff for the final project, lots of deliverables. This is not a class where you're just going to give me the final project at the end. You're going to use stuff throughout the quarter to get to that final thing, because that's how you do good stuff. And then obviously there's going to be a final grade for the project. There's flash participation and also the core projects, right? So whatever your core group got, on this, the average of that, right? We have to come up with the exact formulas and stuff, but basically that's going to be this, okay? The exact percentages I just, don't, don't, don't pull this. When I release the, some of this uh, today or tomorrow, that'll be locked in. 
but I'm just experimenting with this and talking to some of the TAs and some of the mentors just to make sure uh, it's making sense. But basically, this is what I'm thinking about. So obviously, the bulk of the class is on your final project deliverables and the final project is like 70%, right? Everything else is small, but still matters. I want you to have some skin in the game to care about the projects of your teammates, right? In one version of the class a couple of times ago where I didn't do that, I found that people don't share, they don't talk. They don't, because honestly, I wanna focus on my own game. I don't care how anybody else does. So I'm just gonna you know, sit there and just type the whole time for it on my game. I don't want that because it defeats the whole purpose of being in a team together. So just like when you're an Apple and you all win together as Apple or fail together as a company, right? Uh, this is the same thing. We're kind of going to start getting into, into the same boat here. Um, all right. Uh, all the deadlines are at, um, I don't know, wait, it's, what's this thing here? I don't know what that is. So all the deadlines are 11.59. So whenever I say a date, uh, it's right before midnight, okay? Um, and so some things take a long time to upload. So make sure that it, it, you can upload it in time. Especially if, you're, if we ask uh, towards the end, when you get to the alpha release and stuff like that, we'll ask for your source code and things. Those take a long time to, to upload because you'll have like 20 gig files, right? Or something, right? So uh, please, please, please clean them up a little bit pre upload them. Basically, we need that for a bit of things. We need to show proof that the student did this and all this stuff, right? Uh, and then I have this calendar of deadlines to help you because this class, again, it's a little complicated. So let me show you this calendar. I'll post this on there. Um, I just have a couple of tweaks to make to the calendar that I haven't uh, finished, but um, this is the current draft of it. This will be the most helpful resource for you to, uh, to, to, to work out the class because the class can get complicated with everything, all the moving pieces. So... Please, I'll, I'll post this on Canvas and what you use to sort of keep track of stuff. Okay, we're here April first. Uh, you know, and so the purple stuff here uh, is like stuff that you're. I expect you to do, but that we're not going to require you to upload it, right? Because it waste your time and waste our time. So just do it, please. Um, we have the first lecture, and this is the stuff I asked you. Like, go to those tutorials, get familiar with them, maybe. And if you haven't, just start doing it. You know, play with it. It's, it's really cool. There's a bunch of stuff you can learn. Uh, and then we've got like, you know, I do want you to play those, those games from before. I just pick, pick a few, just play them so you get a sense for what I'm expecting. It's really important. Uh, we are going to have project deadlines are in red and homework deadlines. Actually, we're not going to have them up for the last time. And we're going to do these three. Uh, so, for example, we're going to release the first homework today that builds on homework zero that I have, and it's going to be you and you can today and so on. And then we've got some project deadlines because at some point, basically, it's going to be all projects. So if you look a little further, basically, at some point, it's just all project deadlines, right? We're going to have proof of POC is proof of concept. We're going to have prototypes uh, because you're going to have to be iterating a lot of the game, right? First of all, understand what kind of game you're building, start developing it out, come up with the first draft of the game second draft of the game, third draft of the game, and then the final version of the game that's due basically the last possible yes. time slot, right? Uh, and then because we plan to release the game to the public, there is some marketing stuff that I need to do, right? Videos, text, description, tagline, stuff like that. You don't do that in the first class, but you gotta do that in the industry too, right? Because you have to release it to the public. And you have to say how you like to sell it and what you look up about all these markets. So basically, this kind of gives you an, an overview of the class. Um, so the deadlines are basically week to week, where you you start, you know, right right in this part. Uh, I, I'm actually going to enter one more here, but um, this is just all like writing and thinking about the game. And then right after homework three is basically when you really start implementing stuff. Uh, and then this will be the first proof of concept where you're kind of debugging your basic mechanisms and things like that, figuring things out, and then you're building up from that. So I'll post this for your reference. Uh, are there any questions? Okay. And these deadlines do need to be tight. People are like, well, can I, you know, I got sick, can I miss? Because the idea is you're going to submit, let's say your proof of concept to you, and we're going to discuss it in class these two days, right? So we've got your group, you're with six kids, you know, in a, in a cohort, 
And you're going to break out and you're going to do three and one day, three and another day, right? Maybe 15 to 20 minutes each to go through your computer concept. So if you miss this deadline, it's going to create like a pain train ride. And again, this is also what happens in industry, right? Like, so you got to deliver what you've got to deliver. You can talk about what you're doing, but the goal is to keep everybody moving forward throughout the quarter to end up with this great thing at the end. Okay. All right. I kind of want to start moving on to actual material as opposed to all this nonsense of overhead stuff, but I think it's important to somehow discuss a little bit. Um, did I just close my thing? Um, I think that's all I wanted to cover for that right now. Um, we can talk about that more later. Are there any questions about syllabus? I think that was everything that I wanted to, to, to go through for now. No questions? Let's see. I'm just going to quickly just review to make sure I didn't miss anything too important. So we have a, uh, a complete breakdown of all the things and description. Um, some description there, topics. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. All right. So uh, let's get back to slides. This thing's is it still going. All right, so we've got the teaching team, and now um, this is the, the teaching team, the syllabus, the deadline calendar. All right, so like I said, the class is a lot of work, more than the average class. I hope I'm not scaring you, but I'm just trying to be realistic and set your expectations accordingly. Because we're, we're going to create a big system, right? Like an operating system or a compiler. And so writing those at the time, this is why it's a five day class. This is 20 hours to work for a week. So if you're taking like some kids come to me and like, well, I'm taking these other really large classes and stuff like that. Maybe, maybe it's not a good idea. So either drop some of those or drop this one. Um, you know, I, I, I don't mind if people say, hey, you know, this is not for me. But there's certainly there's a lot of cool stuff that we're doing, right? There's a lot of cool stuff that you're learning. So hopefully people will want to take it. Uh, and then for students that put do put in the time, uh, again, we've gotten this feedback that they say this is one of the most useful classes because of everything we're learning. All right, submissions happen through box, like we said. Canvas cannot handle these large submissions. It makes it also more shareable with the entire class. Homework, so the project learners will have their own link uh, to keep things organized. And the spec, it'll say what to use, et cetera. Please name things correctly. That's really important. Um, and then discussion section probably will have only one link. Uh, we're still working out some of the details on that. Uh, the links will be write only, so you can write, and then you won't be able to see anything until after the deadline, and then you can you can see that. So if you need to update the version, simply upload a new one. Uh, and then we're only going to release the latest one. The TAs will just go through and kill the the other ones and and just use the latest one. Uh, we need to we need the things need to be on time though. So twenty percent off the top uh, if you're late, and and for the project roles that cannot be done late, you can get the stuff in the next day of class. Um, and then for some of this, we'll ask you to upload videos of them because it's it's much easier and faster rather than having us compile your code, run it, and see if you implemented a high score screen. Uh, just to watch a video of you showing us that you did it right, it's faster for everybody. So, so we'll ask for a lot of videos. There's a tutorial on how to do the video community. Uh, it saves a lot of space and bandwidth because some of these game projects are really, really good. So to make sure the video demonstrates the personality. For example, like we ask, okay, show that you have a, a high score screen that survives even after you close the game and open it up again. And some kids will just show us the high score screen, but don't show us that it actually surviving this process, right? So you just show us the high score screen, high screen by itself. There's no way to judge whether it's professional with scores and things. Uh, so instead, you show the high score list and you close the game and you open it up again and you show this thing there. That kind of stuff, right? Just show us that the personality is there. All right. What we're going to teach in this class, um, we talked about all this, so go fast, right? What makes games fun, how to design games, how to create systems. Video game workflows, play testing games, get your game ready for release, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? You're going to get software engineering experience and so on. Uh, and then Unity platform, we're going to, like in the discussion section in particular, we're going to talk about Unity, 
Uh, it's a major platform. Uh, you know, it's they used to develop. Uh, they do a lot of web based and, and mobile games, but some even some bigger titles have been made like that. Uh, and there's a lot of resources that we can leverage. That's one of the other reasons to use it, right? And we'll also provide you with stuff along the way. But this is important. Well, we're not going to teach you the class. You know how to program. So how to take your complex program and break it up into smaller tasks. I'm expecting you guys by now know how to do that yourself. So like you can, you know, like I need to code up this thing. I can break it up into subtasks that I can do. Uh, how to architect your system to efficiently use it to debug. A lot. I mean, some of the very high level stuff we will go through, but the low level stuff I expect you guys to be able to do it. Uh, debugging skills. Uh, it's going to be something that we absolutely will not have the bandwidth to do. Or your teammates will not be able to do for the most part because they're also busy with their own game, right? So I expect you to be able to find your own bugs. Maybe you can ask for help uh, in terms of like you're trying to do something new and you're wondering if somebody's used it or whatever. That that's fine. You can ask questions, but but I expect you to be able to debug. Uh, also, we'll talk about C sharp occasionally throughout the class, but it's not. We're not going to teach you like here's how syntax and stuff like that. If you use C C plus uh, plus, it's really similar. You know Java. It's really similar, right? Between C plus plus and Java. So it's something you can pick up very easily if you're familiar with the programming language. It's not a problem. Uh, I will, whenever adequate, I will point out like, hey, this is something really weird with C sharp because there's some really weird syntax things that I, for for I, I'm a C plus plus person. When I saw them the first time, I'm like, oh, this is almost like buggy, right? Because it's such a weird syntax, right? But uh, but you get used to it. Okay. Uh, and then to just to discuss the final project, I'm going to lay out some of the specifications here, which are important to go through. So the class is centered around this final project you're talking about, right? Develop a high quality 3D game. So the game has to be 3D. Uh, a lot of kids say, well, I have a great idea for a 2D game. Uh, and, and here's the reason why I asked for a 3D game. So it used to be that I didn't require 3D. I said you could do 2D or 3D. Uh, a lot of students did decide to do uh, 2D game, which is fine. 2D games can be super fun. But the problem is, in many ways, 2D games are much easier than a 3D game because you don't have to do the camera stuff is much easier. The animations are much simpler. You have some sprites, you know, things like that. You don't have to do with uh, articulated character controllers, things like that. And so you're only getting a subset of the right experience. Now, when I change the requirement to 3D, anybody who's written a 3D game in Unity can also do a 2D game. Absolutely. It's, it's a step down. It's much easier. But if you've done a 2D game in Unity, you're not as comfortable in doing a 3D. So that's why I'm making this requirement a 3D game, because once you do a 3D game, you can do a 2D game for sure. But you can. Now, the game could have more of a 2D look to it in that it could be a top, like the Neuromancy, for example, basically all happens in a 2D environment, basically, right? It's top down and stuff like that. So that's fine. But the characters are 3D, the animations are all 3D, the camera motion is 3D, everything is happening in 3D, right? The, the targeting is all 3D and so on. So that's important. Uh, you can choose any game that you want to make. So any genre game, as long as it meets some basic criteria. I'm going to list some here, and there will be a more formal specification that I'll release in a couple of days. But basically, I need you to be able. You need to be able to own this IP. So you cannot make a game about Spider-Man versus Superman or whatever, Superman versus Batman, because that won't fly. We can't release that, right? The game's meant for release, so we cannot make stuff like that. Or Super Mario World Two, whatever. You know, we can't do that. You need to own the IP or have permission to release it. Should be playable on a PC or and Mac, not or and Mac, both. Why? Because look around. Some people have Macs, some people have PCs. It's got to work on everybody's machine because people are going to be playtesting each other. So it's going to work on the PC and Mac. I'll show you how we'll show you how to make both builds and stuff like that. Um, and some folks are like, well, I want to make a mobile game, right? I want to make it for the Android or for the for the iPhone. That's cool. You can make that, and we'll talk about platforms of distribution in a moment. We can distribute that. Uh, there are just a couple of challenges. So um, first of all, the game must be playable on a PC and Mac still. So you must have a, a PC version, a desktop version of it, right? Because uh, to, to do the, the approach where you have to upload it to Apple so that some third-party playtester can download it, it's a pain in the butt, and we're not going to do that for this class. We're going to do that for the advanced class, but not for this one. So uh, I'd like you to be able to share each other's games and try them out really easily, which means a desktop version, right? Uh, not everybody also has an Android phone or whatever, so it needs to be a desktop version so you can try it and debug it. It's fine if you think that it's going to be eventually a mobile phone, that's great. The other thing is some of the mobile distribution platforms like App Store require a payment to post the game, right? $100 or whatever. 
Now, we'll talk about distribution in a moment, but if you want the third party company to do that, then the game better be for sale, right? Rather than free, because if it's a free game and they're paying $100 to post it, that's a, a waste of money, right? And we'll talk about that, but that's some things to think, to keep in mind. Uh, must be playable with a standard keyboard and mouse. I get questions all the time. Can I make Guitar Hero with a bass? Can I make a drum version of Guitar Hero, whatever? Uh, or or a new kind of interface, right? Or uh, even a game controller, right? Um, do, you know, I used to allow game controller games, but then like, I don't know, 70% of the kids in the class did not have game controllers. And I'm basically running around, getting borrowing, lending, getting back game controllers. It turns into a big pain in the butt. Just use keyboard, was mouse. If you want to have the option to do game controllers because you prefer to play that way, that's great. Just give me an interface that everybody can use to try the game, okay? And it should work hopefully just as good, okay? Uh, please make sure that it works like that. Um, rated T for T. This is important for UCSB. They don't want pornography, adult content, uh, super, you know, gory violence, things like that. By setting a T for T, you can have some scary stuff. You can have some cartoon depiction of violence and things like that, right? You can read the description, the uh, the ESRB description of what that is. We'll talk more when we get there, but basically I want you to be thinking about these things. So it could be a fun game. It could be edgy, all that stuff, right? You guys are in charge. You guys get to decide, but we just don't want things that are going to be huge uh, PR messes and nightmares for UCSB to deal with. Does that make sense, right? So rated T for T or below. Uh, and uh, we're going to work on these games for most of the quarter. OK, so uh, when we talk about public release, there's a couple of venues that we're talking about. So uh, the first is going to be a video game showcase. This is what we do every year, uh, where the public gets together to play the games. We set up a bunch of computers. You guys are there, hopefully still around. And we do this showcase. Um, Doing the showcase during the quarter doesn't work. You guys are going to be so busy working to deliver that final gold master. You're not going to have time to deal with this. So we usually do it in the next quarter, which in this case has to be the fall. So in the fall, if for those of you who are still around or can do it, uh, we'll we'll have the showcase where we you know feature the games that were made. Uh, even if you're not around, we can still feature your game, so you still get some exposure or whatever. Uh, and so people will come and play. But this, you know, this will get, I don't know, a few hundred or a thousand people max to see your game. The goal to get, you know, again, the target, let's say it's 10,000, is to get the game released on some larger online game distribution platform, right? And so you will have the option in this class, you can distribute the game through your own platform, whatever. You can post the game on H.io, you can post, you can do whatever you want the game, it's your game. So you guys can do whatever you want with it. So that's definitely one option. Or... Uh, or and I guess this is you know it's, it, it's not exclusive. Uh, you also have the option to release your game through a third-party publisher right up through them. Okay, and so let me give you some background on this. Uh, I've been teaching this class for a while. We've been gearing to release these games for a while, but as you can imagine, there's a lot of legal issues with releasing games. Right? Uh, lawyers at UCSB are asking me like, what if somebody's playing the game and they get a heart attack? Is UCSB liable? What if somebody claims that this is stolen property and they sue us, et cetera, et cetera. You can just imagine what lawyers do, right? So there was like, again, all I wanted is like, I want the games out there so people can play them and get the students get credit. UCSB gets recognition. It's went all around. So what we ended up coming up after like three years of working with the general counsel with UCSB is this idea of starting a third party company, right? Called Red Athena that's going to be releasing the games on our behalf. So that way, if somebody sues because they got a heart attack, it's not UCSB's problem, it's Red Athena's problem, right? So basically, uh, we've teamed up with this new video game publishing company. And all full disclosure, I, I had to start it, so I basically launched this separate LLC that's going to do the broad public release of the games, okay? So we have a partnership between UCSB and this company, and all the games that we make are going to be, or, or, or the games that, are, uh, that we decide to, to put through there are going to be released through their platforms. So to be clear, you guys own the IP for, for the game in this class. So when you make a game in this class, you'll own the IP. So you don't have to do this, but if you want to, you'll contract with this company to have the game released on their platform, okay? You'll still keep all the rights. You'll still be able to post the game wherever you want and so on. All you're saying is I give you permission to also post the game. And the idea behind this is 
you know, because we were looking at all the options. So one option is to have everybody just post the game on their own. But then we'll have like, I don't know, 60 different links, 60 different storefronts, and nobody is going to get any traction because games are very, very crowded in the marketplace. We tried that once and nobody got anything. So what we did at UNM is we set up a storefront where all the games we would release would go through that. And that way we, it's like, it's like uh, the rising tide lifts all boats, right? Everybody gets a lot more traction. The equivalent of this is like, if you're playing, if you're a, so a soccer player, you can either play on the school team and be televised and play in major games, or you can record YouTube of yourself and post it online and hope you get some traction that way, right? Like, obviously if you're playing with some kind of like more centralized thing, you're more likely to be spotted and so on. So the idea is, and again, this is an option, you don't have to do it, uh, but but usually most most students end up doing it, is you contract with Red Athena to have your game released. We are right now finalizing the contract with the legal and we'll hopefully have that um, in a couple of days or a week or so. And basically all it'll say is you give the company, it, it's long because legal stuff that's being long, but, but it'll say basically that you give the company the right to publish your game. And so it, and it'll be released as a free to play title so that there's no money involved. Okay, the game's gonna be posted for free. So the company doesn't make money. You don't make any money from this game. Uh, in, in for this, this release, you can post it for sale if you want to. You can extend it. You can sell it to another company. You can do whatever you want with it. But the company does not have the right to sell it. Right, that's the thing. And so the game doesn't generate any revenue. They're just doing it to promote the students. That's the whole the whole uh, idea. And so you keep all the IP. You can publish the game yourself or sell it or whatever. And in return, if you do this contract, you're going to get access to a large database of assets to use in the game. So um, I'm going to post the, um, here, I want to post the, So I'm going to post this. So basically, we'll have a, a big, these are all the assets that, that Red Athena owns that people use in the game. So all the games that you've seen with all those characters and stuff, these all came from, from the company. And so as you go through it, for example, you can like, like for example, you, you, you can look at, uh, let's look at the um, asset store. So for example, this is just a sample one here. So this is what comes in the asset pack, right? So you can do stuff like this, right? And so you'll be able to download it for the folks that have done the, the contract. So the, basically the assumption is why wouldn't you do this? Because you, you still own everything and uh, you can get to use all these assets and stuff like that. Okay, so you can check that out. You can do all kinds of cool stuff with these assets. Um, assets are gonna be very important for you because as you're thinking of what game to do, Make sure you have the assets to do that. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, okay. Uh, so return you get access to large database. Are there any questions about this? Because I know this can be confusing. Again, something you don't deal with in your class because most classes you don't release anything to the public. But basically the summary is we need a way, a mechanism to get the games out in a legal way. You guys own the IP of all your games. So we're trying to say, okay, so then you can sign an agreement with this company that will also release them or you can release them on their own. That's the yeah. Will we sign that contract like before we start entering the game? Yeah, probably. I I just hope the the legal counsel because this has to be approved like at the very top. Um, once they approve it, basically the company will or they'll give it to me and then I'll give it to you guys and say here's the contract you can sign it or not sign it. Doesn't matter from the class perspective. It does not affect anything, right? We still go business as usual. But if you want to sign it and then you get access to the database and be done prior to you starting the game. Yeah. So we want to get this wrapped up by you to your group. Yeah. Yeah. How does selling the game So what some students have done is treat the version that Red Athena releases or will release as the demo, which is like 15 minutes of play, like maybe one level. And then they flesh out 20 other levels and they sell that. And that's a great Thing because then you get the marketing of Red Athena to like say, I don't, here's the games, and then maybe you get the, the thing on the back. Yeah. Another option is to, if 
I, this has never happened though for one of these games, but like if another company is interested in like remaking the game or something, they engine the idea they can buy the IP from this group. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Right. We try to come up with something that would would that would be the the, the most uh, logical way. And here's in terms of details of this, uh, I can let me tell you what three days work. All right. So start. Uh, you know, to make a great game, start brainstorming ideas now. I think it's important to start thinking about play the previous games. Like I said, to see what's possible, what's even doable. Uh, make sure the game scope is realistic. This is a really important tip. A lot of kids are like, you know, I love Breath of the Wild. I'm going to make like a Zelda Breath of the Wild, you know, like uh, open world, uh, you know, like all these levels and bosses and, and, and quests. Um, you can't do it in six weeks. <laughs> you know, you cannot do it. Okay? I don't care how, even the people that did the first one cannot do the second one in six weeks. So you're not going to be able to do it. I can guarantee you that. So so make sure that the game scope's realistic. Something that you can do. Okay, we'll talk about thinking the mechanics in the next lecture to help you sort of think about games that are doable. Think about game assets. This is really important. Where are you going to get the stuff to make the game? Right. In a normal game company, uh, the ideas can drive the art because they have a large art team. We're kind of like a game company, but we're kind of a small game company in the arts department. Right. We don't have uh, currently a lot of artists uh, at our disposal. So basically. Rather than having an idea like, let's say I want to set it on Pluto and it's going to have, you know, cyborgs and this, and you can decide what to do it and some people are going to go implement it. It's a good idea to look at what's available and then reverse engineer and gain from that, right? From what you have available. So let art drive ideas is not a bad way to, to do this kind of development, right? Think about what you can do with what you have. Uh, and again, Red Athena has this large database, or you can go on your own. There's There's lots of Free stuff available and stuff like that, you can try getting them, although it won't be as extensive. Be creative, right? So the best games are often simple and creative. And when we talk about creativity, uh, in the next lecture, we'll talk about the theme of the game. So, which is the, the key mechanic that you do. What is it that you're doing in the game? And thinking about that, right? As opposed to, when, when, I, when people try to think of a game and say, you know, take a pitch and stuff, People are often focused on story, right? Which is different. And story is like, I'm gonna make a game about a mailman and the mailman, you know, is, uh, you know, a, an old person. And, you know, like, like they come up with a whole story about this game when that's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is, what is it that the player's doing? Are you driving? Are you throwing envelopes into mailboxes and trying to hit them? Are you catching packages as they drop from the sky? What is it that you're doing in here? You can then fill in whatever story you want later, right? But you need to think about what is it that I'm doing, right? And, and that's really, really critical. Think about twists and all ideas. We're talking about how to do that. But basically, like, yeah, like some games, I mean, I'm sure everybody here has played some games. You can think about games that have been successful and then think of a twist on that idea, right? I've played Super Mario. I know what that's like. But now, what if I've played Super Mario from the point of view of the bad guys? Now I'm an enemy in the Mario land, you know, or something. You, it's like a twist on an existing idea, right? And that's a way to, to kind of stand out because what you want is to stand out from the other games, right? You want something that people will say, wow, this is interesting, this is unique, right? And that's kind of what we need to get to quickly, right? What makes something unique? Right? Already feels like a different class, right? Because we're trying to get you guys to think a little broader than different. Make sure the game is right for the medium, which in this case is a video game, right? There's a lot of games like, uh, you know, Magic Gathering or Pokemon or something. These are card games, which can be fun, or board games can be fun, right? There's lots of stuff. Sports games are fun. But sometimes you got to ask, does it belong on a computer in a video game format, right? Now, there are successful card games, right? Card-based games on, 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 on video games, but they often have some components that cannot be done with just simple cards. Right? Maybe they the cards drive an action sequence and then you do something, right? Which you can't do with, with cards. So always think, am I doing a video game and not just a board game on a computer, right? Which usually ends up being like a lame kind of game. Just fun, but making a video game doesn't make it more fun, right? Unless you change it up a little bit, right? And then it's no longer the true chance of something else, right? So choose a game that's going to make a great video game. Uh, and play to your strengths, right? So you know what you're good at. I don't know what you guys are good at, but you guys know. 
So maybe you're good at modeling and you can model your own hero character. Some people have, and they're like, okay, I'm going to come up with these new abilities for this character and they, they do that. But if you're better at programming, then maybe you do things procedurally and you make your own level generator and you generate cool levels. Um, choose the type of game you'd really enjoy playing, right? Don't pick something that you don't like because it's going to be hard for you to design. It's going to be hard for you to play this because by the end of the class, you guys are going to be so sick of your own game. I can guarantee that, right? Just like the people when they're doing the iPhone or something, they're so sick of it at the end because you've been looking at this thing for hours and hours and hours. Now, everybody else is going to love it, right? But you're going to be tired of it. And so you better pick something that you really enjoy playing. Uh, and, you know, it, because we're thinking broader, right? Think of something that will actually have legs in, in an audience, right? It has a target audience, right? Uh, you know, if you're really into taxidermy, right? And you're like, oh, I'd love to make a game where you're like stuffing animals and things. Like, you got to just think about, because I've gotten some really weird game suggestions and my, my, my notes are always like, well, do you think people would like to play such a game? Because I don't think the, commu the community of taxidermists and the community of gamers have much of an overlap, right? And I'm not trying to, 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 to rub on taxidermy, but it just doesn't feel like something that would be that marketable. And that's your goal is to create something that has value in the community. It doesn't have to be the broadest game. It could be niche, right? But it has to have some, some community. Right? So pick something that would be fun for some reasonably large audience. I think a good target is about 10,000. So we're gonna talk about planning out your schedule making sure we're making regular progress week to week. Um, this is really real. That's why there's going to be deadlines every week because I found that, you know, I used to have uh, sometimes a two week, uh, not break, but two week period to work on the first proof of concept. And I found that the average student simply just waits longer to get started. So instead taking that longer proof of concept period and turning it into two proof of concept periods where you have to deliver and then deliver again means more productive games. It's really funny how things work, right? The It's like the more... The, the more you have to do, the, the more you can do, as opposed to the opposite, right? So this is not the last minute kind of class. This is not like you can just not do anything and just do everything at the end. The class itself won't let you do that. And we're going to learn the tool. We're going to master you in the next four weeks. We're going to do as many tutorials as possible. Walk through the, not only the tutorials we do here, but also do some other things. So already, if you're thinking, hey, my game's going to be um, an action battle royale kind of thing, networking is going to be big. Maybe start looking at some networking stuff because I can guarantee you there's stuff that we're not going to get to talk about in the class, at least not in this class, because we don't have the time, right? We're not going to get to probably nerd networking, right? But some games in the intro class do do networking, right? Because they want to have this 1v1 fight or, or, or whatever. So then that's something that I can I can point you to resources and stuff, but you're going to have to do that, some of that on your own. And I would get started with some of those. Um, and then the more uh, the more you know, the more powerful success you will be, right? And the better and more sophisticated your game will be, and so on. So Google around. Uh, there's lots of tutorials available online. Uh, make sure though, because again, with the release, if you're using major code blocks somewhere else, make sure you have the license permissions. Okay. If the game is released by, if you're releasing the game on your own, you're entirely liable on your own. Like you, you know, if you get sued, that's your problem. Now, if you're raising the right Athena, they're going to provide some protection. But at the same time, if there's something that you didn't disclose, like you used a bunch of stuff and didn't disclose it, the problem is going to be back on you, right? Does that make sense? Because that's your responsibility to say whatever you're submitting is your own thing, or you have the right to use them, and so on. And we'll provide. You'll have to provide documentation for everything, just like a real company, right? You can just release really stuff and say it's all good. This is the way it works. Um, you can post stuff on Discord. We'll try to answer your questions. So you may even ask another student if that happened. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and on the Unity forum, there's forums available that are actually pretty good. Um, sometimes it's better than asking in the class because usually there's somebody who can answer that more quickly, right? Faster and more quickly. And then finally, the assets. Um, this is important, right? So you will need to have assets in your game because you, unless your game is completely blank or something, you need to have something. And so you can buy your assets and make them. Uh, or uh, just make sure that, um, so you can use non-commercial assets because we're not planning on selling the game. The game will not be for sale, at least through Red Athena, and will not be um, having any kind of in-store purchases or any in-app purchases or anything. It's gonna be completely you no know, monetization from that. Um, or, you know, so so you can use them or you can go to Red Athena and access their, their data. Uh, so yeah.
get started. So get the software that you need, right? Make sure you're on speed. Uh, use the correct version of Unity. Again, I stress that. Lots of problems in the past when people had different versions. Go through the Unity, Unity tutorials. We referred to you. Start working on, I'm sorry, so homework zero should be asteroids. Um, to play the other games, work on asteroids. We'll get homework one posted today. Uh, and I'm really excited to see what's going to happen. We've got a good class, lots of uh, fun. I've been interacting with some students offline. It seems pretty exciting. Uh, the quality of the games has been increasing every year. We've taught it just because it's like a ratchet. You see what people have done and you just want to better it, right? And so games get better over time. Uh, and so I expect this year's games will be better. Uh, and this will only, you know, make it great games not only going to benefit you in your career, but it also helps the lab with great visibility for a program and so on. So it's a great opportunity, right? Okay, I think that's uh, all I wanted to say for today. Let's um, please um, let me know if you have any questions. We'll talk more later. Um, stop the recording.